knocked out. And then I just go through and I pick them all up and I put them back down. And I don't ever stop. I never take a break, I just keep going. I did maybe 10, 12 sprints, full out sprints, and then I did, uh, oh, I don't know how many. I can't count them all. I did so many different weights. I did curls, I did push ups, I did presses, I did double leg, I did double leg sit squats and push. You know, but the point is, is that, listen, I'm not sure if you guys know it or not, but you heard what I said to those cops, you know? We, we are on the verge of something that we don't understand. And I think you always gotta be ready. You always gotta be ready. And probably what I do the most of, just so you guys know, is the kettlebell swings. I probably do the most of those right there. I do the most kettlebell swings, because the kettlebell swings are your power. That's where you're gonna get all your powers from those kettlebell swings. So, you know, I'm out here in Texas. I'm in the middle of nowhere out here. So, you know, and I know that the audience that we are, you know, Gen X and uh, some millennials and baby boomers, you know, you gotta stay active. You gotta be picking up weights and putting them down. You know, sometimes I'll just go through and I'll pick up weights and I'll put them down and I'll pick up weights and I'll put them down. You know, my entire workout sometimes, just so you guys know, because I'll just take this weight right here, put it up in the air a couple times, and then I put the weight back down. And then I walk over, and I walk over to this little lighter weight, I'll grab the weight, pick it up, pick it up, put the weight up a couple times. You know, you gotta stay active though. You gotta stay active. You know, a lot of people contact me, and they're boomers, and they're getting older, you know, you have to continue to train. You can't stop training. You can never stop. You can never stop. You have to be ready to go in case you have to go. You gotta be ready to go. You gotta be ready to go. You don't know what's gonna happen. We don't know what's gonna happen with this world. I mean, look what's going on over there in Europe right now. You gotta be ready to go at all times. And that means you have to be physically fit. The amount of sprints I did today, I'm telling you, I might not be able to walk later. I did so many sprints today. I mean, I absolutely crushed it. So, yeah, I just wanted to come on for a couple of minutes and uh, let you guys know what's going on in my head, in my world. Let me pop over to the other side here. But I'm out here in the middle of nowhere here in Texas. So, you know, you know, I want to talk a little bit about some history here. I, I put in two different videos, Hugo Black. And our country was ruined by the, by the Warren court, Earl Warren's court from, I think it's 1952 until 1969. Could have been 53 to 69, but 52 or 53, 1952 to 1969. And that was the Warren court. And so that's where you get MLK Jr. Uh, talking about the white liberal is a fox, is a wolf in sheep's clothing, I believe is what he said. And that's where you get that is from Earl Warren's court. Earl Warren is, you know, I, I say it all the time, I'll say it again. If there's a hell, Earl Warren is in it. Because what Earl Warren did is he was a Freemason. He was, he, was, he was president of the Freemasons before he was the Attorney General of California. So you're talking about, you go back to Earl Warren. Uh, I think he's going to be born. He was older than Hugo Black. I think Earl Warren's born in 1891. And Earl Warren, after he becomes, he, yeah, because he, he, he kind of skips World War I. And the way he does that is he says that he has hemorrhoids. Guess who else had hemorrhoids? This guy did. And I had surgery and I had him removed. But, but he skipped war because of World War I. So he's born in 1891 and then he's gonna go 1891, 1901, 1911. So, so the, the World War I is gonna start in 1914 and gonna go till 1918. And what Earl Warren is gonna do, just so you guys understand the history, Instead of going to war, he goes and serves in, in, in some uh, maintenance functionality of service. And then what, he, what happens, the, the big screwy here is how Earl Warren and Harry Anslinger live parallel lives. Because Harry Anslinger, I believe he's going to be born, 
I believe he's born in 1896, Harry Anzinger is, because he's born the same year as Plessy versus Ferguson. So they have two diametrically opposing war careers. So Earl Warren is going to skip doing any kind of real military service. And the way he's going to skip that is by saying as hemorrhoids. And then the polar opposite is going to be Harry Anslinger. Harry Anslinger in World War I, he's going to be stationed at The Hague in the Netherlands. Now, there's a very funny time period of history here. Because in the beginning of The Hague, at the beginning of World War I, you're going to have the creation or the beginning creation of what will soon be the League of Nations. And the League of Nations is truly going to take form after Hitler is defeated. It wasn't Hitler, it was a different general, a different leader in World War I, but it was Germany again. And then Hitler is going to take over as president or chancellor of Germany after a guy named... Um, um, I want, to, I want to say Schneider, that was his name. And he's going to push this manifesto that Germany needs to be a single race and they need to get rid of all the Jewish people. But I want to continue down the parallel of Earl Warren and Harry Anslinger because I would love to know in history if these two guys ever connected. Because here's what's going to happen. When Harry Anslinger goes over to The Hague, what's going to happen is He's going to become associated with a new organization that's going to be formed called the World Health Organization. And Harry Anslinger, because he's at The Hague all through World War I, he creates these amazing connections with super powerful globalists. And so when Harry becomes one of the beneficiaries of the fossil fuel industry and of DuPont's plastic industry and of William Randolph Hearst's newspaper and wood industry, he's going to use those connections that he makes in World War I to make sure that cannabis, marijuana, they changed the name to it in 1937. But so, so now he's at the Hague from 1914 to 1918. And a lot of people don't know this about Harry Anslinger, but he had already spoken I want to say Austrian, but I don't know if that's the proper the proper language for over there. And so Anslinger, what he's going to do is he's going to become a double agent. And th this is, you, you guys can look this up on history because when I started to read about this, I was absolutely floored that Harry Anslinger was a giant war hero. I didn't know that. And so he he serves in the military through World War I. And then when he gets out of World War I, so remember, he he's the... I'm not, I'm not sure if he's the youngest of 10 kids, but he's raised in Pennsylvania and he is a, a part of a gigantic family tree, Harry Anslinger is. And what's going to happen is when he when he finishes his service and World War I comes to an end, instead of coming home, I believe that Anslinger stationed in the Bahamas for a while and what his job is, is to chase down uh, drug smugglers. There's always been this gigantic war on chemicals and let me just ask you something. How's it going? How's the war on chemicals going? How's it going? The number one killer of Americans today is drugs. So that whole war on chemicals, I guess it just didn't work out, did it? I guess it just hasn't worked out. But we continue to perpetuate it and fund these disgusting policing organizations. And they get bonuses and promotions based on drug arrests. And then we see Zach Wester in Florida, who, you know... Did he get life in prison for how many lives he ruined? I don't think he did. So now when Harry gets out of the war and then the war ends for, for Earl Warren, Earl Warren becomes a Freemason. And a lot of people talk about Freemasons, but there's kind of a lot of misconception from my understandings of Freemasons. And what's going to happen is, you guys, I'm sorry, I can't see. I, I can't see at all. I don't have my glasses on, so I, I can't. I literally cannot see anything. I, I can't, and unless I put glasses on, I can't read any of the chats. I'm trying, I wish that I could. Let me see if everything else is on properly. I hope that it is. I hope I put everything correct on this chat. I don't know if I did or not. So then when Harry gets back from you know chasing down drug dealers in the 1920s, when he gets back into America, this is the beginning of truly the first movement for black liberation in America. 
And Harry Anslinger, he cares, he's racist for sure, but that's not his goal. Harry Anslinger was raised poor. He started being a cop on the railroad when he was 14 years old. So he's a career cop from 14 years old until he dies in 1975. And so when he gets back, by this point though, Earl Warren has gone to law school and now he's a Freemason. And then he runs for attorney general of California and he wins. And so he's the president of the Freemasons for five years right after World War I. And then when he, when he becomes president of the Freemasons, what Freemasons are from my understanding, and there's just, you know, I'm only an expert in the things I'm an expert in and everything else I don't, I know what I don't know, if that makes any sense. And so from my understanding of what a Freemason is, what a Freemason is, is what they're going to do is they're going to write the walls of society. They're going to write what should be law, what should not be law. They're going to write the understanding, the comprehension, the application of creating law uh, to, to control the masses, to control people. And so this is going to happen with Earl Warren. Earl Warren is a power hungry. I mean, I have nothing good to say about Earl Warren. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And, and I'm going to get into the specifics of Earl Warren here in a moment. But let's go down the line, and I want to parallel Harry Anslinger and Earl Warren. And so now, by the time we get into the 1920s, what you're looking at here is you're looking at America that is so divided based along race. Now, I don't want this to be true, but this is true. America is divided along race because in the in the mid 20s you're going to have the 1926 case i believe it's 1926 or 1927 i'm pretty sure it's 1926 of Corrigan versus Buckley so america is is deeply divided and and people want to you know segregation happens in 1896 with Plessy versus Ferguson legal segregation and it's really sad that our country is so divided based on race but it is and it still is and so what's going to happen is the 1926 case of Corrigan versus Buckley, what that case does is it upholds racial restrictive covenants. And I wanted to pull out my step and repeater and show you guys a visual, but I'm absolutely wiped from that workout and I don't want to set up a step repeat right now. I'm just wiped out. I did so many sprints. I could barely count them. I'm dying. I'm, my mouth's dry. I should probably drink some water so I don't have the crusties in the side of my mouth. I'm sorry if I do. So the 1926 case. Now, so the parallel, just so you know, if we're paralleling Earl Warren and Harry Anslinger. Harry Anslinger is deeply involved with the biggest pockets of industry. And I'm talking about John D. Rockefeller. I'm talking about Andrew Mellon. I'm talking about Andrew Carnegie. I'm talking about William Randolph Hearst. So what they're doing in the 20s is they're creating a synonymous parallel line with alcohol and drugs. Because remember, prohibition is going to start in 1920. And you know who's going to prosecute those cases is Earl Warren. He's going to prosecute people for alcohol through the 20s because he's the district attorney in San Francisco, I believe. And But who's the biggest alcohol swindler in America? Who's the number one uh, uh, swindler of alcohol in the United States of America? It's the cops. The cops are. The police are the ones who are the biggest alcohol swindlers in America. And it's by far. It's not kind of. It's them by number one and then everybody else. And you get this. You find this information out if you read the Wickersham Commission that I have on my website for free. Go to deletelaws.com. Go to downloads and just scan the Wickersham Commission. And the Wickersham Commission that I have on Delete Laws, it's a tiny sliver of the entire commission because the commission starts in 1929 with the good old help of August Vollmer, who's going to militarize police from using the Wickersham Commission. And now the FBI is going to start in 1908, but then it truly gets its form in 1924 when uh, J. Edgar Hoover is appointed to the head of the FBI. So I'm giving you a lot of information right here around 1919 up to 1926, 1927. This is what's going on in America. 
Anslinger is on the inside with the people with the big pockets. The League of Nations in 1925 is going to put cannabis on the list of banned uh, chemicals. And what is the League of Nations? These are the nations who had to oppose Germany to try to have some semblance of security. But what's happening truly is, what was her name? Her name was... Elizabeth, oh, she gets appointed. I don't want. I don't want to get. I don't want to get confused. I want to stay on just the the. Main, but there was a woman actually who was appointed as an ambassador to the League of Nations from America who worked with Harry Anslinger. She, her, her husband was a diplomat, but she had far more power. She was way more influential. So she convinces the League of Nations in 1924, 1925 to put cannabis on the bans act uh, on, on the banned list of chemicals. And you're going to have the 1914 Harrison Act that's going to happen that's going to make it so that you have to get your prescription from a doctor for everything. And then they're going to add this new chemical called cannabis. And I'm giving you all this backlog because this is where the police state prison state is created from 1914 until 1920. Six. That, that, that time period in history. Now, what's the good news? The good news is, is that history is cyclical. It circles around every 60 to 120 years. So that time period of 1914 until 1926, where are we are now? We're 2014 to 2026. So we are literally on the cusp of change. What's happening, though, is the government is trying to create legislation that will allow just the top 1% to be the distributors of chemicals. That's what's happening. And Harry Anslinger, because he's deeply involved with the fossil fuel industry, he's now working globally with this new World Health Organization and this new, this new thing called the League of Nations that will later become what we all know as NATO. And so this is what's going on. And so when when we, when the, when the United States passes the Volstead Act of 1919, which is the prohibition on alcohol, what's going to happen at this point is an authoritarian police state in the United States of America. Remember, the temperance society that's going to start in 1820, it's going to push this, this, this narrative to ban alcohol for a hundred years. And some of the biggest leaders in American history are a part of the temperance society. I'm giving you guys little pieces of information because the more you stick in here, as you listen and you learn more, it's gonna all come together for you if you are able to, 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 to pull these things and keep them in your mind. So, so now Harry Anslinger, when they're gonna ban cannabis and they're gonna ban alcohol, you're going to now create a police state based on being able to police chemicals. And it can't be done. It simply can't be done. We cannot arrest our way out of people wanting chemicals. But that's not why it's being done. We're not criminalizing chemicals. You know, the Temperance Society, I'll give them this. The Temperance Society, not only is it a, a, a distinctly conservative movement, it is also... Uh, authoritarian. They want to be able to control people. They want to be able to control if people can have a drink of alcohol or not. And so when they successfully passed the Volstead Act, and I've come full circle now, in 1919, that's shortly going to turn into the 18th Amendment in 1920, and it's going to be enforced in the middle or the end of 1920, where they're prepping everybody that the police, <laughs> who are they going to be the biggest alcohol swindlers, the police are going to now uh, arrest people for alcohol and it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. And so they have this idea that they can come down with a hammer fist on people and that they'll be able to ban alcohol and it doesn't work. And because it doesn't work, what the federal government starts to do is poison alcohol so that it becomes an exigent circumstance. And this is going to be the case out of Detroit called the exigent circumstances clause created from the 1921 case of Carroll that's gonna be heard at the Supreme Court in 1925. And this case of 1925 is gonna create the exigent circumstances clause that you've heard me talk about dozens of times. And so now as we move forward into 1925, 1926, 
You have Earl Warren, who's now running for elected office, and he never loses. Earl Warren never loses. And you have Harry Anslinger, who is pushing hard inside of the government to create the Federal Narcotics Agency. And so during this time period, Harry Anslinger is hip to hip with a guy named William Randolph Hearst. William Randolph Hearst is, has the biggest newspaper industry in America, the biggest newspaper industry in the world. As a matter of fact, he even sees a guy named William Lloyd Garrison as a guy that he wants to, that he wants to, he wants to, he, he wants to emulate. He wants to be, he, he, he thinks that William uh, Lloyd Garrison was a pioneer in a lot of ways because William Lloyd Garrison, just so you know, he ran the Liberator publication from 1830 until 1865, or was it 1835 to 1865? And William Lloyd Garrison never missed a publication. Never. Every single week he published the Liberator magazine, uh, the Liberator newspaper, and this is widely known as the first black newspaper, the first black publication. And so William Randolph Hearst has this idea that he wants to be even bigger. He wants to release a paper every day, and he knows that the power of propaganda in newspapers. And so because William Randolph Hearst has pretty much a monopoly on the newspaper business and on the wood business, the lumber back then was a very big business. And so what's the competition for lumber? What's the competition for wood? It's, it's cannabis. It's hemp. Hemp grows a gigantic forest every year, and then it, it, you can take it down, and the next summer, you're going to uh, grow a gigantic crop of hemp, and that's going to be the, the basis for cannabis. I'm sorry I'm all over the place. I, I'm, I'm out in the middle of nowhere, and I, I, I got a lot of things in my head here that I want to kick out to you guys because I want you guys to learn some stuff here. If you want, I'll, I'll turn my chat on here so I can see what you guys are saying. I can't see it though. I got to put my glasses on. So now we're still in around 19, we're, we're in the beginning of the 1920s. We're in the beginning of the 1920s and Harry Anzinger's come back to America. He's pushing for the Federal Narcotics Agency and America itself, the people of America, America's be, been desegregated, is not desegregated. We're still a segregated society from the 1896 holding of Plessy versus Ferguson. But Americans, people who are Americans, they're coming together as a nation with people and black folks and white folks are starting to come together, even though you have the 1921 Perry race lynchings, which are just horrific. And you've got a series of lynchings all through the 1890s and 19, early 1900s. And you can thank the rise of the Democratic Party with Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland's going to be president from 1885 to 1889. And then again, from eight, 1893 until, uh, 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 yeah, from 1893 until 1897. 90, so Grover Cleveland is, you know, if you if you research Grover Cleveland, he what he does as a matter of fact is because because Democrats haven't won. They haven't won an election in so long. So then what he does is he appoints a bunch of people throughout government that are going to push this racial segregation and lynchings. Lynchings. You know, the number one lynchman in America was police. I mean, these are just facts. And so you have this push of on the Democratic side, the KKK and lynchings and killings, and on the right side, you have these people who are coming together where they're starting to they're starting to move in next to each other. You know, black folks and white folks are starting to live together in the same neighborhoods, and America's supposed to be legally segregated. So now we're in the mid-1920s, 1926, Corrigan versus Buckley, and you got Harry, you got J. Edgar Hoover appointed to the head of the FBI in 1924. And J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI was one thing before J. Edgar Hoover, but really, and for just so you know, uh, um, this is the, you know, I talk about the FBI truly starting in 1924 because that's when it truly starts. You know, you have the red summer of 1919 where, and, and just so, so black folks who are watching and white folks who are watching that don't understand how deeply uh, the race divide has destroyed our country. Just so you guys know, black people in America would not be free today. We would still have a segregated, maybe even worse society had it not been for World War One. 
World War I, you saw the return of 350,000 black troops who came home from World War I after serving under the English and the French commanders because white commanders wouldn't lead black troops in World War I. And, and when they came home, you ha that, that's what caused the Red Summer of 1919 because you had black guys who were over in the war for four years and they come back, they're used to being treated as equals. And then when they come back to America, you come back to this America that still has lynchings going on and racial segregation and you can't date a white woman, you can't date an Asian woman. I mean, I'm speaking from a man's perspective here, obviously. And so the Red Summer of 1919 is truly the reason why black people are liberated in the United States of America. Because when those black guys went over to World War I and they learned how to fight and they learned how to kill and they learned how to organize, when, when they got back to the United States, they then taught other black guys that, you know what, you don't gotta put up with that. What that caused though, just so you know, and I know I'm going on a caveat here away from Anslinger and Earl Warren, but I, I just wanna give you guys a rounded perspective of history. What's gonna happen here is you're gonna have what's called the Red Summer of 1919. And there's two different kinds of Red Summers of 1919. The first one is based on the Red Scare of communism and socialism. And the other part of the Red Summer of 1919 is, is how many black dudes are being slaughtered for coming home from World War I and expecting that they'd be treated like equals after serving in wars, and they weren't. So now America's trying to come together, but the powers that be, the Earl Warrens, the Harry Anslinger, the J. Edgar Hoovers, they don't want a, 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 a together society because if us peons, and I'm a peon along with most of you or commoners, if we're able to come together, well then, you know, we might find that we're really a lot the same. And they can't do that. So the 1926 case of Corrigan versus Buckley is going to create this idea, and, and it's not an idea, it's a legal precedent. It's a, it's a, when I say legal precedent, I'm talking about it has the same precedent as Plessy versus Ferguson of 1896. And the 1926 case of Corrigan versus Buckley is going to say that you cannot sell your house to a person of color. And if you do, not only have you broken the law, you can be prosecuted, but your neighbors can sue you civilly. Because if you move in that Mexican or that black guy, you're gonna drop the property value. And so if you do move in someone who's a person of color and the, and the courts don't personal, if the courts don't prosecute you for that, well, then your neighbors might sue you and then you lose the value of selling your home anyway. And so, so now, J. Edgar Hoover, and this is all this time period of the of the mid 1920s, and and the reason why I'm telling you this isn't to make you disappointed, but it's actually a beautiful rose about to bloom in the mid 2020s, because history is cyclical and it and it changes. So we are this generation, Gen X and Boomer and 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 later millennials. We're now the leaders, and now we get to cause the change, the opposite change of the 1920s. So that's where we are today. So now Corrigan versus Buckley, plus the idea of uh, J. Edgar Hoover going into the FBI and Earl Warren coming to power. And then in 1930, you're going to, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but Harry Anslinger is going to be appointed to this new agency called the FNA, the Federal Narcotics Agency, which will later turn in the DEA that we should abolish. The DEA should be abolished. The number one killer of people globally by police is the DEA. The DEA is the most disgusting organization in all of the world. There's very few organizations that are as disgusting as the DEA. It's absolutely atrocious. It is atrocious. And just so you guys know, DEA, when I get executive power, I'm going to kick you out of California. You're gone. I'm getting rid of the DEA in California. So, so they'll try to kill me just for saying that. They, they, and they may get, they may actually do it. So just so everybody knows, I'm not suicidal. I'm not Epstein. I don't want to hang myself, but the DEA is the most disgusting policing organization in the world. And, and by the way, where are they centered? Where's the DEA? Missouri. Missouri. What's the biggest police state in the world? Missouri. Missouri. And what does Missouri have that's different than everybody else? The Policeman Bill of Rights is in Missouri. How did the Policeman Bill of Rights get to come to power? The DEA. 
So, so you have to understand when you, when you have an entire state creating a, a, a bill of rights for cops, we have a problem, Houston, and we need to shut that down. I want to stay back in the history of time here. So, so now you have this trifecta of men, Earl Warren, Harry Anslinger, and J. Edgar Hoover. And these three men in the 1920s are super duper powerful, very powerful. And so Earl Warren, and I'm going to get into the, the deep history of Earl Warren here, but what the, the, the big problem that we have that, that you and I are facing now is the League of Nations and John D. Rockefeller. So in, in now let me, let, excuse me, let me explain to you how big the, the global war on cannabis is. The reason why there's a, the, a war on marijuana is because of the fossil fuel industry and because of the newspaper industry. As a matter of fact, John D. Rockefeller in 1924, he's going to give a $10 billion grant to the Museum of Cairo in Egypt. So why does he do that? How come he does that? Is it because that hemp could be the leading energy source in Egypt or they could go fossil fuel? This is up for you to decide, but I don't know of, uh, of any other oil tycoons. So can someone do the math on that for me? I can't see the, the chat, but the, the, when you give $10 billion to the Museum of Cairo, then how much is that today? $10 billion in 1924 is worth how much today? Okay, so, so now what's gonna happen here is you have the League of Nations that's being spurred on by who? Harry Anslinger. And how, do, and how does Harry Anslinger have these connections? Because he's a, a big undercover war hero in World War I when he meets the founders, the very basic foundation of the, the bureaucrats who are going to lead the League of Nations. And who is Harry Anslinger working for? He's working for John D. Rockefeller and, and, and William Randolph Hearst and uh, 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 Lamont DuPont, I believe it was the third. And so Harry Anzinger is working behind the scenes as a cop, trying to make sure that he criminalizes cannabis to make sure that hemp can't compete with DuPont's plastic industry and William Randolph Hearst's lumber and newspaper industry and John D. Rockefeller's fossil fuel industry. So now, the other thing that's going to happen here is because the temperance society has pushed forth the mandate of banning alcohol from 1820 until the Volstead Act of 1919, you're going to have the overwhelming legislators who are voted into government are funded by the temperance society. And the temperance society now puts enough legislators into power that they are able to successfully criminalize alcohol in 1920. What does this do? This creates a double agency out of police. Police are both the biggest alcohol swindlers and the most authoritarian oppressive body in the world. They are oppressing the American people under the guise that they're helping with alcohol. Well then, why does the Wickersham come out in 1929 and say that cops are the biggest alcohol swindlers in America? Because they are. So this is where you get the two-faced uh, pig agencies that we have today. They create this idea that they are enforcing uh, 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 prohibition and at the same time using their radios to to make sure that this little small shipment of alcohol goes through but the giant shipment goes through this one gets arrested the small shipment but then the huge shipment that they take a large chunk of from lucky luciano or al capone it gets through right here and this is you, you guys can you guys can truly see the manifestation of the police and what they've done with the 1929 case of of uh, the 1929 St. Valentine's Day massacre. Where are you going? I'm talking to people. I'll be right back. So 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 you know if you guys are not familiar with the 1929 St. Valentine's Day massacre, this is where a bunch of gangsters are slaughtered. One gang slaughters another gang. An alcohol gang slaughters another gang. But who truly does it is the police. 
they're wearing police uniforms and history just somehow all through history, they just forget this part that they're all wearing police uniforms when the slaughter happens. And how do they get those police uniforms? And how come they all those people who are dressed as cops just walk away from the St. Valentine's Day massacre? And what's the big push of 1929? Ban sawed off shotguns. That's the push of 1929. Now today, what is it? Oh, ban the AR-15, ban this gun, ban that gun. How well has that worked out? Take every single blue state in America that has banned guns and it's the number one problem in their different cities and states is gun violence. Because you cannot ban things from Americans. We don't want it. America doesn't want to be banned on anything. So now as we push forward here, the real disgusting part is that 1926 case of Corrigan versus Buckley. Because you finally have an America that's trying to come together, but they can't allow that. They can't, and, 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 who's, and who's the pusher of that? Earl Warren, Earl Warren. Because remember, now I'm, I don't wanna to jump too far ahead to World War II, but I, I wanna stay right here in the mid 1920s. So what happened so far? Let's just take a real quick history check. So you have you have the you have J. Edgar Hoover's taken over the FBI in 1924, which from my perspective is really the start of the Federal Bureau of Investigations, because J. Edgar Hoover is gonna tap into the telecommunication companies. I crushed the workout and then I just started talking to you guys. So the reason why J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI become so powerful is because telephones have become a mainstream thing. But back in the 20s, the telephone doesn't work like it does today. The tele what, what the FBI does is they just create whole divisions within the, tele the telephone companies where you call and you say, can you patch me through to Mr. DeCastro? And they go, okay, we'll patch you right through. And then they plug your line into my line and then my line rings and I pick it up and I go, hey, Billy, what's going on? But meanwhile, within all the telecommunication company, you have its own individual sex of FBI guys who are just listening in on your, on your conversation. They're just listening right into what you're saying. And so what this does for J. Edgar Hoover, and he's the head of the FBI, from 1924 till 1974, I think he's the longest running head of a police agency in the history of time. I think he's 50 years, I'm pretty sure. Someone can fact check me on that. I can't see anything without my glasses. So if someone fact checks me, and then yesterday, you guys, I made a mistake. I said uh, Susan B. Anthony instead of Betsy Ross with the flag. I know the difference, but when I get emotional, sometimes I, I lose track of uh, cerebral. What happened here is, J. Edgar Hoover, he starts to take over the telecommunication companies and he starts to listen to every phone conversation and he starts to blackmail people, especially gay people because he's gay and he hates other gay people. Remember, back then the big, uh, uh, and it was Protestant back then, by the way, the Catholic thing happens later, but the Protestant uh, religious organization is the leaders. And back then in the 1920s, if you're gay, you are an abomination. And you're seeing the same thing with Turning Point USA. Hey, Turning Point, sorry guys, the ship has sailed. Most of us accept gay people. Most of us accept gay people. The large majority. And the Turning Point USA is bashing gay people all the time now. Why? Why are you so concerned? I just don't get it. You know, I was a kid on the playground and I wanted to kiss girls and never, and I, and, and just so you know, I graduated with 60 some odd guys in my graduating class. That's how small of a town I'm from. And over, we have over 12 or 14% or, or of my graduating class in Alaska that is extremely conservative. I think my, the, where I'm from voted for Ted Cruz. So we are an extremely, I'm not nearly as conservative as some of my, of my classmates, but at least 10 or 15% of my personal classmates who are Gen Xers were gay. And never along the line, as I grew up, did I decide that I wanted to date dudes just because I knew about gay. You know, this turning point thing they're doing is turning me off big time, big time. It's a big turnoff. You guys are bashing gays at turning point. I just don't get it. I don't get it.
if a kid is gay, he'll be gay. Not like I'm going to decide I like dick one day because I heard about gay people. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. So because J. Edgar Hoover is gay and he feels so terrible about being gay, what he does using the telecommunication companies is he will then find out who the gay people are and then uh, he will then blackmail them. And I'm not talking about a couple. I'm talking about all of them. And he's got a record of who's gay. You know, I mean, I'm sure you guys heard about Marilyn Monroe and JFK. How do we find out about that? J. Edgar Hoover. That's how. So now as we continue down the line here, so you're going to have J. Edgar Hoover, 1924, Corrigan versus Buckley in 1926. It's going to create legal uh, uh, mortgage restrictive covenants, racial restrictive covenants where you can't sell your house to a person of color. You have, you have Harry Anslinger pushing for, for a new f sort of drug agency you're going to, and I don't want to jump ahead to the thirties yet. I want to stay right here. So, so, but behind the scenes, you have Harry Anslinger and he's trying to get a drug agency created, which he's going to successfully do. And that's going to not going to happen until 1934 with the federal narcotics agency. And also you're going to have the uniform, this, I don't want to jump ahead of the thirties. And so, so then you also have uh, Earl Warren who is actively prosecuting people for alcohol and everybody knows it's the cops. Everybody knows it's the cops. Just like today, people, even people who are biggest cop suckers ever, they still know the cops are scum. They know that, but they're still cop sucking because they're afraid. It's all fear-based. Everything's fear-based. Everything is fear-based. I could go into detail on that, but I'm going to stay really focused here on Anslinger, Earl Warren, and J. Edgar Hoover. So now we know and we find out that it's it's very widely publicized because there's going to be two separate cases that uphold prohibition at the Supreme Court. But one of those cases is going to be the Olmstead case, Roy Olmstead of 1927. And the 1927 case of Olmstead is where that Seattle police lieutenant is bootlegging alcohol between Canada and Seattle. And he's got a whole group of little piggies with him. And the Supreme Court, when J. Edgar Hoover taps into his line and listens in, then they prosecute Olmstead. And this is also the William Howard Taft court. I don't even want to get lost on William Howard Taft because he's such a piece of, 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 he's such a piece of poo. William Howard Taft goes down with Hitler. He goes down with Mussolini. He goes down with Mao. He goes down with, uh, uh, he's really, really a horrid person. I can't even, I'll get lost if I start to talk about William Howard Taft, the biggest piece of crap ever, ever. Is he as bad? He's not quite as bad as Hitler because he didn't slaughter 6 million people, but he's pretty bad. He's pretty bad. He slaughters so many Filipinos, they don't even keep count. So, so, so now, so now what's going to happen here in the 1930s is you're going to have you're going to have uh, Earl Warren he's going to push for the governorship of California and he's going to win eventually here and you're going to have you're going you're going to have that Olmstead case where William Howard Taft's court they know that J Edgar Hoover has tapped into the line of Olmstead and and they uphold Olmstead's conviction and what that means is that is that J Edgar Hoover is going to be incentivized to continue to tap people's lines. And I think William Howard Taft's, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's it's um, Oliver Wendell Holmes. Oliver Wendell Holmes' famous line from the Olmstead case is gonna be, and it could have been Taft. Um, was it Oliver Wendell Holmes? Because Oliver Wendell Holmes is in the is in the Civil War in 1865, but he's only 18 years old. And then he's on the court. Oliver Wendell Holmes is on the court from, I think it was, from 1901 to 1930. Oliver Wendell Holmes is on the court for 30 years. <laughs> you put a piece of garbage on the court and then you leave him there for three decades. So the famous line, though, just so you know, whether it was Taft or Oliver Wendell Holmes, the, and it's called a holding when they write their holding at the Supreme Court level. His famous line is, civil liberties be damned. That's what he says. If we catch you breaking the law, we're going to prosecute you and uphold that conviction. All of William Howard Taft's holdings are overruled. 
all of Walter Wendell Holmes' holdings are overruled when they all die and a new Supreme Court comes in and eventually looks back through a different lens of history and says it's unconstitutional. And I believe the case that's going to overturn the Olmstead case is the 1967 case of Katz. Is it, is it 57 or 67? It's Katz. The Katz case. So, we're still back in the 1920s, and you, you got this push of prohibition. You got cops running everything. You got cops running the gangs. Cops are the British alcohol swindlers. You have J. Edgar Hoover's poisoning barrels and bottles of alcohol. You have the 1925 case of Carroll, Carroll versus United States, is going to case the Carroll Doctrine, which is exigent circumstances, meaning that if there's a loss of life, if the police are in hot pursuit, or if they need to seize evidence off of you, well, then they can circumvent your rights. And why is that passed? Based on a mandate. Because alcohol has been, they tried to make alcohol illegal for 100 years, they finally get it, and then nothing matters. And this is the difference between a procedural law and, this is the difference between, between a procedural or common law, it's called common law, or substantive law. Because a procedural law or a common law is based on a process of law. It doesn't matter what happens to you because the process of law is more important than the substantive law of humanity. And so the Carroll Doctrine is going to give police absolute power over us. That's where it all comes from. From the 1900 case of Bad Elk versus the United States and from the 1925 Carroll Doctrine, which, which just says that we can circumvent your rights if the cops say so. It's just disgusting. And we're still dealing with it. It's in the trifold. Oh, the, trif the trifold's in my pocket. But it's, it's in the trifold. The, the Carroll Doctrine, I, I put it in the, in the trifold, and I mentioned the 1925 case because cops are so dumb. They're so uneducated about the law. You can simply explain to them that the Carroll Doctrine was created to seize illegal alcohol out of your car. So, now as we push forward here in time, what's going to happen is you're going to get that 19, the 1926 case of Corrigan versus Buckley, 1927 case of Olmstead versus the United States, and then you're going to get the 1929 St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And the St. Valentine's Day Massacre is going to set up all of your legal gun laws that are going to happen with the 1934 federal, uh, what's it called? It's called the the... Federal Firearms Act of 1934, and it's signed into law, which is going to make it so that the feds have a way that you have to register your guns and they can try to limit the kind of guns you can get and how many guns you can get. It's disgusting. So, and it's based on cops helping the drug gangs, or the alcohol gangs kill each other. So this is what's happening. And so now, but here's what's really going to happen. Here's what's really going on behind the scenes. I want to give you guys the truth so that you truly understand the reason why there's a war on drugs. It has nothing to do with your health. Zero. It has to do with hemp. The entire war on drugs that we face today is because of hemp. That's why the League of Nations bans hemp in 1925. That's why John D. Rockefeller gives $10 billion to the Museum of Cairo. It's a way to launder money to slip it to the bureaucrats in the League of Nations so that the League of Nations will push the fossil fuel industry. I mean, these are just simple facts of history. And so then you're going to have uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover is just pumping away at violating our civil rights. A, a very mad gay man mad at himself for being gay, which is just crazy. And, and just a small caveat, so many, so many people who try to cut me down or like they'll go on my Facebook page, which is open, or they'll go on my Instagram, which is open, and they'll say that I'm gay. Oh, here's the really funny one, that I married a man, that I've married a man previously. Let me tell you guys something. If I married a man, I'd be holding his hand and I'd put it on my Instagram. If I was gay, I would be so out. I would be so out. I would, I would be just the biggest gay flamer ever because I don't give a shit what anybody thinks. If I was gay, I would be gay and I would love it. But I'm just being honest. Because by the way, just so you know, if you go out in Hollywood, don't go out in Hollywood. Go to West Hollywood. Go to the boys town. You're gonna have so much more fun. Way more fun. Not as much aggro uh, guys who wanna fight you. And at the same time, the music is better, the drinks are stiffer, and the women are more fun because they're in a gay community where the gays will, will stick up for them and they can be 
uh, a little more liberal with their dancing and having fun and flirting because they're they're in a gay club. And so anyway, so uh, just a small caveat there because so, someone said uh, the, the troll, Some I have so many trolls, it's incredible, that I used to be married to a man and the guy they say I was married to, just so you guys know, is my cousin. That's my cousin's name that they say I was married to. Anyway, so crazy. And then my fake criminal record going around too. So... <laughs> This is what happens when you decide you're going to lead. People want to take a shot at you. But when I run for governor, everything I've ever done will be laid out. So I can't hide anything. So, so now what's going on in America? We've created an authoritarian police state, prison state, based on the idea that we can ban alcohol. And we can't. And we've created this new uh, FBI. It's FBI from 1908, but a new FBI that their main purpose is to ensure that that they tap into people's phones and they ruin people based on gossip and the gossip magazines. And who is J. Edgar Hoover working with? William Randolph Hearst from the newspaper industry. And this is where the true politics of today take form where you're going to slander someone in a tabloid. And what did we see with Trump, with the Inquirer? The exact same thing that happened in the 1920s. It all stems back from the 1920s. America was ruined in the 1920s. Well, I mean, it was ruined with the racist holdings of, of the Dred Scott holding of 1857 and the Plessy versus Ferguson of 1896. And so, so now what else is going on? What else is going on? What's going on is America is about to hit a very bad depression. And so you're going to have this depression that's going to hit and it's going to last all the way till FDR's administration in 1932. But, but the, big, the big thing here is the idea that they're criminalizing alcohol and putting cannabis on the ban list for your health, for your safety. We're saving your children. Because they start all this propaganda that is based on the idea that marijuana will turn your kid into an axe murderer. An axe murderer. Did someone just say blue bacon? I just saw that. Just so you guys know, I watched a tiny little snippet of blue bacon. His analysis was incorrect. It was incorrect. <laughs> I think uh, cops have duties we have rights or we have rights, cops have duties. He put a little snippet of blue bacon being a fraud. There's all, I'm gonna have all these people who are gonna be haters, you guys. It's, it's not gonna stop. So if you support me and you believe in me, believe me, dude, I'll just lay out the truth because I don't give a damn who likes it. So, so I'm just getting trolls. I don't know if anybody, uh, X Factor, are you a mod in here? Yeah, X Factor, feel free to kick these guys out, any of, any of the trolls. Yeah, but you got to remember, pe people like people who troll, they need leaders to be able to suck off of. You, you need someone who's a doer to suck off of. So now as we continue down the line, so you got, what are, the, what, are the, what are the cases? What are the three cases that really, really mess us up? It's going to be Corrigan versus Buckley, 1926. Olmstead versus United States of 1927. And then you're going to have the Carroll Doctrine of 1925. So we'll go 1925, 1926, 1927. Carroll of 1925, Corrigan versus Buckley of 1926, racially restrictive covenants for your mortgages. And 1927, Olmsted versus United States is going to uphold prohibition. And they're going to go, look, we locked up all these cops for bootleg and alcohol. And William Howard Taft's an authoritarian piece of garbage. Oliver Wendell Holmes is a piece of garbage. And these people are elevated to the Supreme Court. Why? Because they're appointed. They're appointed. So, so now as we push forward here, now we're going to get into the 1930s. And what's going to happen in the 1930s? A guy named August Vollmer in 1929, he's a contributor to the Wickersham Commission. And August Vollmer is going to militarize police. And what is the militarization of police going to be based on? The 1929 St. Valentine's Day Massacre. The same cops who gave the uniforms or participated in the massacre, the same cops, then they're going to save the day. We need to militarize cops. And this is done by August Vollmer. You know, I haven't done a full layout of August Vollmer. Maybe I should someday, but I haven't done it yet, but I will. So, so now, as you continue to push forward here, 
You're going to have the federal narcotics agencies that can be created in 1934. And who's going to, again, you're talking about appointments. And who's going to be appointed to the head of the federal narcotics agency? Harry Anslinger. And what is, who is Harry Anslinger working for? For the fossil fuel industry, for Andrew Mellon. And so what Harry's going to do in 1934, and you got Earl Warren, who's going to be, be the, he's going to be, I think in the 30s, is he the attorney general of California or, or is he the governor? I, I can't quite remember. So, so, so now what you're going to have here is you're going to have this Harry Anslinger, who is then going to create so much propaganda around marijuana. And remember, why is the propaganda happening? Because of the plastic industry of DuPont, the newspaper industry of William Randolph Hearst, and the fossil fuel industry ran by John D. Rockefeller. And then, you know, I could, I don't want to go back in time, but the breakup of Standard Oil in 1911 is going to create the 1914 Harrison Act, where you have to get your prescription for your, for your medication from the doctor. That the, the breakup of Standard Oil in 1911, and I do a three-hour lecture on this, so I don't want to get lost on that. I want to stay focused on the people who ruined America. And the reason why we have a war on drugs today is to make sure that cannabis can't compete with the fossil fuel industry, plastic industry, and newspaper industry. And so, so now when Harry Anslinger comes into power and you create the Federal Narcotics Agency, the same year that the Federal Narcotics Agency, so prohibition is gonna end in 1933, but the reign of J. Edgar Hoover and his disgusting uh, eavesdropping on people and blackmailing people, that doesn't end until 1974. And so, so now you have Harry Anzinger who's pushing this bullshit war on drugs, bullshit war on cannabis that's just not true. It's not true at all whatsoever. Cannabis does. And just so you know, you can go to my website, Delete Laws, and I want you to download the 1944 LaGuardia Report. I believe it's the 1944 LaGuardia Report. Because a few years, I, I don't want to jump to the 1944. I want to stay, stay super tight to... What's up, Maddie? I'm just giving a history lecture. I'm almost done. Uh, my phone's going to run out of juice here shortly. But then uh, we can go for a jam around the property. Oh, yeah! <laughs> oh, man. Freshy! Freshy! <laughs> Got to go, yeah. I'm out. I, I tried to take a day off today. It's not possible. So now you're going to have... So now what do you have going on? You have you have what? You got J. Edgar Hoover's in power and he's pushing this propaganda of blackmailing people. You have Harry Anslinger. He's pushing this fake war on drugs, fake war on cannabis to protect the fossil fuel industry. And then you have the the propaganda of, of William Randolph Hearst in the newspapers who's writing newspaper articles about how this kid took one toke of marijuana and he killed his whole family. It's all a lie. It's all lies. So that's why I want you guys to download the 1944 LaGuardia Report uh, off of my website. And I want you guys to read the 1944 LaGuardia Report. In the back of the LaGuardia Report, which you can get on Delete Laws for free. I don't sell it. It's free. Uh, I didn't write it. It's not mine to sell. At the end of the 1944 LaGuardia Report, in the back of it, if you go to the last 10 or 15 pages, it shows the different kind of testing they did on cannabis. And what they found is that cannabis has no character changes. So this is where how we lost America. This is how we lost our country. This is how we lost our freedom in this country is through Harry Anslinger and through, and through J. Edgar Hoover. And now we're going to push forward into the 30s. And this is where things are going to get really, really ugly, really ugly. Because the beginning of World War II is going to decimate our country. But more than that, FDR, FDR, what he does with the, with the New Deal, he cuts out black people. And that's what creates the black criminal class today. You can't have haves and have nots on the same block and not create criminality. And this goes back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau's famous lectures on the social contract, his famous writing on the social contract. And what does Jean-Jacques Rousseau say? He says that if when you have haves and have nots, people who own property and people who don't, you're going to create criminality. 
because people want food, shelter, and warmth. And for food, shelter, and warmth, people will lie, cheat, and steal. And when you lie, cheat, and steal, that's breaking the law. So I'm giving you guys a bigger view of history so that you can start to see how our country was ruined and how is our country ruined by appointments. When you appoint men to power, it ruins our country. It ruined, and that woman, I can't remember her name at the League of Nations, but she was the real catalyst for creating the League of Nations banning cannabis in 1925. So, and what happens in 1925? The Carroll Doctrine. So Anslinger comes into power with the Federal Narcotics Agency of 1934. And then you have J. Edgar Hoover, who's, who just got, prohibition has just ended, but now what's the big push? To make sure we get any illegal alcohol people. What's the big push today? Get people who are dealing marijuana illegally, right? It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. But the way they did that is they poisoned the alcohol so that people who were creating alcohol, obviously they must be criminal. They must be a criminal. So, so now here's where things go. We're always, American people are not that racist. It, there's, there's a big, large, I mean, if you, if you count the whole, it's almost like Islam, like Muslims, right? There's a very tiny, tiny sliver of Muslim people who are terrorists, but there's so many that that tiny sliver is a lot of people. It's the same thing with racism in America. It's such a tiny sliver of people in America who are racist. But when you take 314 million, that tiny sliver is a lot of people. And so, so America is still trying to come together. We're trying to come together. But when you allow presidents to appoint Supreme Court justices, I put in the last two videos that I produced the clips of Hugo Black talking about, well, what if he wants to do something a little less than arrest him? Well, what do you mean, Hugo? What does that mean a little bit less than arrest him? It means torture cuffs. That's what it means. And so the very first appointment that FDR is going to make is a devout member of the KKK, Hugo Black, who is going to uh, create this idea that this is going to calm the nerves of the leaders of the white supremacists in the KKK. Because when you appoint Hugo Black, listen, when, when you're a lifetime member of the KKK, you go to meetings and you swear you ain't never going to let no blackie come power. You swear you ain't going to never let no black man do nothing. We ain't going to let black guys like that date white women. And it's all based on sex, just so you know. you don't, They don't want those black guys dating those white women. And now that America's becoming a creamy brown and we're all a little bit colored like me, my mom dated, married a Colombian and now I have this kind of funny skin tone of, of a light brown, right? But funny, did I say funny? But you know what I mean. I, I, I now have this little darker complexion than a pure white guy. And so now that our country is becoming a creamy shade of brown, uh, light, dark, light, creamy, or dark, creamy, we're starting to come together as a people more and more and more. And the government is not able to segregate us as much and, and separate us as much because we don't identify just purely on race anymore. As a matter of fact, I'm out here in Texas at one of my best friend's house. I've been friends with this guy since I was 21 years old. And when I came to his barbecue the other night, he, he and I were the only two white people there. Everybody else was black. And, and that's in deep in the heart of Texas. So, so now, Harry Anslinger and Earl Warren are going through the 30s and they're kind of on this parallel chorus of making sure that, that America stays completely divided based on race and class. And that's because they've been appointed. That's why. And so the 1934 appointment of Harry Anslinger to the Federal Narcotics Agency is coupled with the 1934 Uniform State Narcotics Act. Now, a lot of states don't adapt the 1934 Narcotics Act because they're tired of prohibiting alcohol. They showed that it ruined our country and they don't want to start enforcing drug laws. But Harry Anslinger is relentless. So he's creating propaganda, showing all this stuff about marijuana. And now I come back to where I was. Sorry, I got distracted with my buddy. Um, and now we come full circle back to where, to where we understand that, that the, all that propaganda from the 30s, if you read the LaGuardia Report, we find out that it's all garbage. And Harry Anzinger, he's going to die with $19 million in his pocket in 1975, but he was a, a career cop. So how do you have all that money? Because he was deeply involved in the fossil fuel industry and he was deeply involved in, 
in uh, illegal activities with by by collusion by the the literal definition of conspiracy is what Harry Anslinger did, and so FDR comes into power and. Earl Warren is the governor of California, and what he does is when world we enter into World War II in 1939, and so Earl Warren in 1942 is going to go to, FDR is actually going to come to California, and Earl Warren is going to tell FDR that we need to lock up 100,000 Japanese people, and that's who Earl Warren is. That's who he is. He'll later in his biography say that he's so sorry that he had that idea that we should lock up 100,000 Japanese people. It doesn't change what you did to the, to the people, dude. It doesn't change. So, um, uh, so I, I can't see that. I can only see once in a while. I can only see like a little, I can only see like little clips of stuff come in. I can catch a word or two, but I got to squint. I could, I could grab my glasses, but I'm going to finish this lecture. So, so now Harry Anslinger, remember, he's on a mission because in 1937, you're going to get the Marijuana Tax Act that's going to be passed. In 1937, the name of cannabis officially changes to Mahawana so that the legislators can then use the word Mahawana and make it like Mahican, Mahican. I don't know how they did marijuana to Mexican, but somehow they did. And so all this propaganda about racial relations where a white woman's going to want to sleep with a Mexican or a white woman's going to want to go off with black guys if she smokes marijuana, that marijuana turns your kid into an ax murderer. They'll take pictures of a crime scene and they'll, they'll put a joint down on the table and go, look, this mur woman was murdered and here's a marijuana joint. I mean, they do this ubiquitously all throughout the 30s. And this is pushed by who? William Randolph Hearst, who's working with who? Harry Anslinger. And so... So now, in the beginning of World War I, in 1937, FDR is going to appoint Hugo Black, one of seven Supreme Court personnel to the Supreme Court, and he's a lifetime member of the KKK, so that kind of gets the white people to calm down. And if you notice, in 1938, the white lynchings go to zero. Zero. I, I believe it was 1938 that the white lynchings go to zero, because... When you satisfy the members of the KKK by appointing Hugo Black and, and FDR, I don't know what the inside conversation is, but just imagine it goes like this. Hey, I'm going to appoint Hugo Black. Stop killing white folks. <laughs> There's no other way to see it. I'm really, really sorry. So, so now as we continue down the timeline, that now you're going to have Earl Warren who's going to convince FDR to lock up 100,000 Japanese people. We create concentration camps in New York City. Uh, Grand, uh, what, what, what is it, the, uh, the, the gigantic park there, Grand Central Park? You got giant concentration camps in, in Grand Central Park locking up Japanese people. It's, it's incredible. And FDR is the greatest president in U.S. history. Really, just so you know, it was Eleanor. Eleanor was the brains of that bunch. But... But so so anyway, as we continue down the line here, and so now so now this is this is how our country is totally ruined, because when you when you when you witness just so you know, Hugo Black is such a piece of garbage because he's born in Clay County, Alabama. I think in was it 1886 or 1896. It, it was 18. 1886, and I th I think that w Warren's born in 1881. I, I I'm really bad with numbers. I'm a little bit dyslexic. So, so now Hugo Black. The reason he's such a piece of garbage is because he's witnessed lynchings for most of his life, most of his life. I mean, that's just the fact of the matter. The ma I'm gonna pop this out for one second. Just put in my charger, just so I, my phone doesn't die in the middle of the lecture. Can you guys still hear me? Okay, I'm really sorry. I, I just got to put a charger in, or my phone's gonna completely die. So, so now what's going to happen here is you're going to have this big push, big push to criminalize cannabis, criminalize cannabis, criminalize cannabis, cannabis ruins people, cannabis is this, cannabis is that. And so when the government sees that they can criminalize a chemical, later you're going to have the CIA create crack in the, in the late 1970s and then distribute it through through LA through a guy named Rick Ross, but I don't want to lose focus here. I want to stay as focused as I can. And so here's where you know that Earl Warren is such a piece of shit. 
he gets appointed to the Supreme Court, I believe, in 1953. You got the Uniform State Narcotic Act of 1934. You got the war on, you have this war on drugs beginning back then, and it's all done in the name of big capital. A lot of people will say that cannabis has been criminalized because of racism, and that's just not true. They used racism to criminalize cannabis, but they did it solely for big money. They really did. Uh, and that's going to be because Harry Anzinger has a stake in the fossil fuel industry. He has a stake in DuPont's company. He has a stake in William Randolph's Hearst newspaper industry. And cannabis can definitely, definitely compete with the cannabis industry, with, with the, with the, new, with the uh, lumber and newspaper industry. Um, and just so you guys know, sometimes I, I misspeak on words and I go back and I watch some of these things and I make a mistake and I say some things that are mistakes. I'm not perfect. I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I'm self-educated. So if I do make an error, you know, I'll, sometimes I, I watch back things I said and I'm like, oh God, like when I, when I said Susan B. Anthony instead of Betsy Ross, obviously I know the information, but sometimes I make mistakes. I'm not perfect. So now you got the appointment of Hugo Black in 1937, and then he's going to be on the court for 30 years. What happens when you put a piece of shit on the court for 30 years? They create an authoritarian police state, prison state. The appointments of the Supreme Court have got to go. We need to elect those people. Just like we elected senators in 1913 with the 17th Amendment. We have to do the same thing here. We have to make a dramatic change. We have to change this. And that's why I have to become an executive. I have to. And you guys know that there's going to be a bounty on my head. I want to abolish the DEA. They're going to want to kill me. And they are thugs. DEA is disgusting. So, so now, as you move forward in time here, when, when, when Earl Warren is appointed, he's already locked up 100,000 Japanese people. Here's how you know Earl Warren's a piece of poo. Here's how you truly know. It only takes two researches, two researches, and here's what they are. Look up the 1961 case of MAP versus Ohio, M-A-P-P. -P. I, I, the details, Map, Dolores MAP, she's involved in pornography, so the cops raid her house, right? And so the Supreme Court creates fruit of the poisonous tree. And the map, the, the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine is still around today. That the cops can't raid your home without a warrant. Or so you think. But then, because the police are the biggest lobby in America, they really are. There's not the same kind of lobbying industry then that there is today. And so when, when the police, when Earl Warren successfully passes Matt versus, oh, 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 I forgot. I'm so sorry. Someone, someone sent me a message when I'm going to finish this, then I'll come back to this in 61 in Matt versus Ohio, where they say that you can't go into someone's house without a warrant. And they never came up with a warrant for Dolores maps, uh, house. What's going to happen is. In the police are then going to picket Earl Warren and of the 115 Supreme Court personnel, none have ever been impeached. Zero presidents have ever been impeached because it's a great big club and you ain't in it. I got that from uh, 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 George Carlin. It's a great big club and you ain't in it. <laughs> so, so, so now in 61, Matt versus Ohio creates fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine. What happens also in 1961? Harry Anslinger holds the single convention on narcotic drugs in Manhattan and he invites who? All of his friends from The Hague, all of his friends from the World Health Organization. And wh what do they do? They then back up all of the propaganda that was created by Harry Anslinger in the 30s and 40s that was debunked in the LaGuardia Report of 1944. And the World Health Organization backs up Harry Anslinger at the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. And he says, they, they say, yes, if you smoke marijuana, it'll make you comatose. <sighs> You're just crazy after you smoke marijuana. And so that 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 happens in 61 when Earl Warren passes Matt versus Ohio. And then the police are picketing up and down DC all over America that that 
Earl Warren needs to be impeached. And who are they picketing to? To white America, to the white people who are, who, 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 <laughs> I mean, our racial divides in this country. Because in 61, if you look up any of the footage from 61, they don't want to desegregate. White America does not want to desegregate. And so, so they're picketing Earl Warren in 61. Harry Anzinger holds the single convention on narcotic drugs where the European nation comes in, the, the League of Nations come in, and which is now NATO. And they're going to, is it NATO in 61? I don't think it is. I, th I think it's still the League of Nations. And they're going to say, you know what? Cannabis is, is going to kill your children. And this is 61. So then Matt versus Ohio, with the help of the 1961 single convention on narcotic drugs in 1963 is the famous case that i talk about all the time of kerr versus california kerr versus california then wipes out the 1961 case of map versus ohio and what it specifically says is that is that if the police come to your house they don't need a warrant they just need to knock on your door announce police 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 and then they can kick your door down whose whose video did i see the other day of the in new jersey or new york where they kicked that guy's door down for a property line violation so the the comparison here when you're looking up earl warren to find out what an absolute fraud he is and what a piece of garbage he is you can look up the single convention on narcotic drugs harry anzinger hosts it in new york and invites all of his friends from the league of nations from the hague from the world health organization and then they back him up, of course, because he tells them, hey, look, we just nuked Japan. You want us to nuke you? And so what happens then? Then you have the Philippines and Vietnam and, and um, Thailand who then make marijuana a, a death sentence. You got marijuana, you'll be killed. And why does Thailand, Vietnam, and, and, and the Philippines make marijuana a death sentence? Because Harry tells the government there. If you don't make marijuana illegal and you don't police it like we do, we'll drop a nuke on your butt. And so all those those uh, S southeastern Asian countries, they then make marijuana a death sentence. I mean, these are just simple facts of history. Harry Anslinger had so much power. He told them we will nuke you. And they did exactly what he said. And then when the police told Earl Warren, we're going to impeach you. Because the 61 case of Matt versus Ohio, he then passed Kerr versus California. He contradicts himself and says, police just need to knock on your door. That's it. And what do we see today? 100,000 home invasions a year. When I get executive power, home invasions are banned. No more home invasions at all whatsoever. It's not making the war on drugs any better. We're going to ban the war on drugs. It's gone. Done with it. No more raiding people's homes. No more raiding people's businesses with a bunch of pigs. And that, thank you, Joe Biden. Joe Biden creates a civil asset forfeiture process, which you can see on the video called Power Corrupts. I take the actual clips of Joe Biden on the Congress floor saying, "We with civil asset forfeiture, we can take your house, we can take your bank account, we can take your boat, and we can fund new police agencies all from seizing your, your property through civil asset forfeiture. And so now police departments today are incentivized by what? The war on drugs. If they seize your shit, they get to keep it and use the money for themselves. Cops are getting bonuses. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. So now you can clearly see the, that, that Harry Anslinger and Earl Warren and J. Edgar Hoover, three people who are appointed along with Hugo Black, I, 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 you know what? I can't help it. I hope they're burning in hell. I really hope they're, you know, I hope God forgives them because I can't, but I hope they're burning in hell. I hope Satan has his pitchfork up their butt. I really do. I can't stand these pigs. I can't stand them. And we see the same pigging agencies today. So, so now, so now in 63, 63 only happens because of the 61 single convention on narcotic drugs. That's why it happens. That's literally why it happens, okay? And so, let me put my microphone back in here. I think we got enough juice to finish this lecture. I hope we do. And so now, what I want you guys to understand is that when we appoint people to government positions, it ruins our country. Appointed people, look at Sonia Mayor. You, you, 
you, you fraud, Sonia Mayor. A hundred thousand kids are on ventilators. Sonia Mayor, you are, you are, look at every woman we've appointed to the Supreme Court. Look at every one of them. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, disgusting, disgusting. Uh, 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 Sonia Mayor, disgusting. Absolutely. Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman appointed to the Supreme Court, disgusting. In the 1985 holding of Tennessee versus Garner, which makes it illegal for cops to shoot you when you run away, even though I just saw a video the other day of a cop shooting someone as he runs away, seven to two it passes that you can't kill people when they're running away from cops. But Sandra Day O'Connor writes a dissenting opinion. We need to be able to kill people when they're fleeing. That's what Sandra Day O'Connor writes. When you appoint anybody to a lifetime position in government, Harry Anslinger, uh, 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 J. Edgar Hoover, Sandra Day O'Connor, Earl Warren, Hugo Black, Sonia Mayor, any of them, Samuel Alito, look up, look up the case of, of Grudy versus Doe. G-R-O-O-D-Y versus Doe, D-O-E, because it's Jane Doe. And S Samuel Alito, in the case of Grudy versus Doe, uh, uh, Jane Doe, he votes, I mean, it, it, it doesn't go in his way, but he writes a dissenting opinion saying that, no, you can strip search women. Go ahead, strip search them and just have men around them, and it's perfectly fine. Samuel Alito's disgusting. Clarence Thomas? Clarence Thomas and his wife, Jeannie, the world would be better off without both of them. Really. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. We cannot appoint people to government positions and think that the world is going to be a decent place. The people are the sovereign. Going back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau's social contract, we are not based on the Hobbian social contract. We are based on the, we are based on the Rousseauian social contract. The Hobbian social contract, Thomas Hobbes, says that the government is the sovereign. We are based on Jean-Jacques Rousseau's social contract that says the people are the sovereign. We are the power, but we are not the power when you allow appointed people. That's the point. We got to get rid of appointments. Federal judges are appointed, has to go. Supreme Court justices are appointed, has to go. I don't want people appointed at the DEA. I want the DEA wiped out, but that's not the point. So, someone wrote me the other day. I, I do this with my hand all the time. I've done this since I was a kid. When I talk, I, I do this. Someone wrote me the other day and said to me that this is a secret satanic symbol. <laughs> Okay. 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 So, so far, just this past week, I've heard that I was married to my cousin, a guy. I was married to a dude. I've seen a fake criminal record about me that none of that's true. I don't have a criminal record. I've, I haven't been charged with felonies. It's just crap. I've never been charged with assault. And uh, now the hand motions that I make when I touch my finger to my thumb... And by the way, I'm actually spelling out a secret code to other Satan worshipers. <laughs> Who the hell are these people? Who are these people? You know, it just is incredible to me. So, so now you guys truly have an understanding about, a, and that was the whole point of this lecture. I knew I was going to get there eventually. Appointed people to government is bad. It's bad. And if you don't know that, then you can look up the Lochner era of court from 1897 to 1937. Even after we elected senators with the 17th Amendment in 1913, the Lochner era continued for another 20 years because all those Supreme Court justices were appointed. And who were the people in the Supreme Court? That would have been the Taft Court and the White Court. <laughs> I mean, it's just disgusting. It's just disgusting. We have to take our power back. And if we don't take our power back, we're screwed. Your children, my grandchildren, your grandchildren will be screwed. I mean, I don't have any children. So, <laughs> but when I run for governor, we'll find out if I do. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, you ready, Maddie? Yeah. Okay. I, I don't eat till night. I don't eat till nighttime. I'll have another nighttime when it gets dark. I'll have another coffee though. I'll, I'll do another coffee for sure. All right, I got to get out of here, guys. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Um, remember, everything I talk about, you can get on my website for free. Satanic messages, satanic messages. Uh, <laughs> um, you can get on my website for free. You can get the Mullen Commission, uh, the Racist Origins of Gun Control. You can get the LaGuardia Report on my website totally for free. You just go to my website. You guys, uh, you got a lot of you guys are taking advantage of the free trifold download that ends on Monday. So make sure you tell a friend. Go to my website. Put in free trifold at checkout. When you go to when you go to you just put a trifold download, and then when you get to checkout, that's where you put in the words free trifold. Uh, a few of you guys have bought products. I'm super grateful. Thank you. I'm super grateful. Those of you who have bought my products on Delete Laws, I am so grateful. You have no idea because I have to take an emergency trip this week. I have to take an emergency trip. Um, I'm not going to tell anybody where I'm going, but I'm taking an emergency detour before I head over to Louisiana. And then I'm going to head to Louisiana. I'm going to go talk to a doctor about getting implants for my teeth. As you know, these teeth are all fake. So I have to get implants in my teeth. I'm going to go talk to a friend who does implants here in Dallas. And uh, I got to get these teeth fixed. I, I can't have my teeth popping out of my head when I'm talking. And it's happened a few times because I got I just have partials in here. So I got to get my teeth fixed. So those of you who have contributed and bought my products, that's that's what I'll spend money on myself on is my teeth. But other than that, I, I just can't I can't waste any money or any time. So those of you who have bought my products, I, I'm really grateful. I can't even, you know, and, and by the way, someone someone bought products from me yesterday. I sent you a trifold too because you bought all digital products. I just put you on the list for the trifolds. And I'm sorry for you guys who are waiting for trifolds. A little confusion between me and the factory. They thought I said bi-monthly. I said bi-weekly. Every Monday and Friday, I want to ship those trifolds. And so KV on over at Image Score Printing, he then shipped every thing yesterday or the day before yesterday so if you're waiting for your trifold it is coming i'm really sorry it was just a miscommunication between kavion and i and now that's been fixed so uh please take advantage of the free trifold get use the free trifold for the digital download if you can afford to buy it please do so it's only 15 dollars uh the the hard copy is 25 so i do appreciate it thank you so much for your support it really means a lot to me uh stripe canceled my account uh stripe uh where the for my donations on my website they they canceled my account um you know i have a lot of people who hate me so you know it is what it is they, they canceled my account so i can't take monthly donations anymore if you do want to donate to what i'm doing you can use the pay apps they're all my name they're posted on every single video i ever make so thank you so much for your support i super appreciate it if you guys have any questions don't feel free to email me can't get the body cam at gmail please let me know if you can't get body cam and uh, I will pop up on Tuesday or Wednesday when I take that emergency trip. I have an emergency trip I have to take. There are people being persecuted in a state here that's about 10, 12 hours away from here. I'm driving there on Monday or Tuesday because those cops are not going to bully those people any longer. I, I'm, I am, I am. When you guys hear what these cops are doing to these people, it is, it, it has to be exposed. It's another Brookside. So I'm going to go up there. All right, cool. Uh, you guys have any questions, don't hesitate to email me. Sorry I was all over the place on the lecture. I'm not perfect. I'm just a human being. <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> this is satanic. <laughs> oh, God. I actually love God. I actually love humanity. All right, I'm going to get out of here. I'm just talking shit. Love you guys. Thanks for watching. I appreciate you guys, and I will see you on the next one. Later, Gator.